Hello, welcome to the Sleeper Podcast. This one's a very in-house episode with the co-owner, Glenn Thompson, my partner in crime, who's been with Sleeper now for two years. Before that, he directed many films in a multitude of different genres. The variety of his portfolio is actually insane. He's just an all-round great filmmaker. Um, Talented producer as well, organizer, problem solver, just general source of production he just makes stuff and yeah he's also a, a keen climber he's doing been doing more and more mountain biking but we go into details about him getting into mountain biking from the filmmaking side of stuff um our experiences in the education system and how that affected us our inspirations the move to discovery eso this next year and what that means in terms of there being a semi-final our thoughts on the broadcast it's a lot of it was speculation and yeah i thought it was quite a good conversation but you tell me enjoy <laughs> we're here we're here glenn thompson films of glenn thompson films <laughs> dot com forward slash glenn thompson films that's it yep the exploding animation logo <laughs> i was thinking about this this is a world exclusive <laughs> because I've never actually done like a podcast or interview of any description. So this is like... No way. Yeah, I was thinking about it. I, I've only ever done like a five second soundbite for something. I've never done like a any sort of in-depth conversation. So That's banging. It's quite funny. Well, I'm honored to take your virginity. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, I was going to kind of start from the start again i think it's good to give people like a general idea of how we came to interact with each other why did you start why did we get involved with each other why did we get involved with each other or or why how how did you get to this point well those are big sweeping questions dude. those are big very i was hoping for like oh what do you have for breakfast or something for us like break me into it, you know <laughs> straight to like meaning of life <laughs> uh what yeah how did we get connected i think it was through yeah the the whole when i started filmmaking and doing mountain bike specific stuff it was literally like yeah it was all just for my mates and local woods and shooting mountain bike stuff not because of anyone telling me to not because i was getting paid for it but just because i i love doing it and i think that's what resonated with people who were watching it like it just seemed fun and like carefree and I guess that's what caught your eye with it. I was going to say, what was the first Glenn Thompson Films production that you uh, ever watched? It was probably the Innis video, and then I delved because I was like, "Who's you went this into guy?" The archive. <laughs> yeah, because in the last one, I was like, "Oh, you know, you were the only person doing like like you weren't the only person making cinematic mountain biking films, but you were the only person that was making cinematic mountain biking films that felt accessible." Mm. So they were like with normal people, whereas like Stu Thompson was making videos with Danny McCaskill. It's like that doesn't feel very accessible at all whereas you were making them with people that were like of like a like a medium to high caliber like ryan middleton and stuff like that so mm. it's funny like we went from so like the history goes like we started just you know cycling in our local woods uh, which was completely flat and then we heard rumors of this mysterious place like falkland and there's like there's two kind of good sized hills at Falkland and one of them has like this whole trail network and there's some old school free riders who built like a load of North Shore and like dirt jumps and flipping doubles and road gaps and like going from like cycling on a flat woods with your mates and like building a tiny little kicker of like you know some dirt and just pedaling like crazy to get into it and then just you know land into flat just to go to any sort of gradient at all was like oh shit this is like the next level you know and I remember uh, around about that time, we'd, we'd, me and my mates just all got GoPros. I think it was the GoPro Hero 2. And like, you know, it was that thing in like school, like every day at school, we were like looking at it at lunchtime on the computers or go to the library and just research, find like the cheapest like website you could find like a GoPro. Uh, and obviously at the time it was just like, just trying to find like a deal. Cause it was like, I don't know, 200 pounds or something. And that was like, oh my God, are we going to do this? You know, <laughs> <We're gonna commit laughs> so, this. so we all ended up with GoPros and we did a bunch of like random videos where we're like, you know, we're playing like almost like video game-esque style games where it was like capture the flag or something, but on bikes. No and, way, that's uh, amazing. Yeah, so it was like, you know, you got your, your two teams breaking up and then one team's on foot and one team is on bike. 
So as soon as you get onto like a main path, you can like pedal away from the person on foot. But then to to where we had to pick up the item, it was like a helmet or something. We had to like, you know, the people on foot could ambush. So it was all this shit and we all had GoPros on and we made these videos where it was just like all of us, you know, with GoPros. And then I like in post, like synced them all up because we started recording at the same time. And then you could see other people's perspective and it was so funny because it was like, you know, I was like, oh shit, that's where he was. That's where he was. Like, I couldn't see him, you know, until he came out and he like spotted me miles away, you know, or whatever. That sounds like we need to do that again. <laughs> that's like, sick. That was a like, great idea. <laughs> it was, uh, it was pretty fun. And then, you know, and then me and my, like my, one of my good friends from school, like um, a guy called Fraser, he, we went up to Falkland to scope it out. And uh, like, we didn't even take bikes. We just went up there and we we're like, no, I think we did take bikes, but we were just like on foot because we were just like, trying to figure out what was there and the bottom section of Falkland there's some like big gully gaps and big like drop-offs and dirt jumps and everything and so I remember I filmed this oh this is dead cringy but <laughs> filmed this video called the trailer or the teaser and like I made it like a super like dubstep like sick teaser and all I did was filmed like the features at Falkland on my GoPro like super fish eye <laughs> it was like the, it was so like hype it was so hype and then I showed it to everyone at school and they were like Jesus, this is like, fuck me, this is going to be nuts. <laughs> so I made like a teaser and went and just go showed everybody it and they were like, oh my God, this is so funny. So like, and then I think the following week we all went up to Falkland and started like, you know, investigating these trails and then it, and then it came into this thing. It was just like, you know, we're all just writing and, and filming and, you know, whatever. And I, I kind of like took a shine just to like, you know, doing a bit of writing, but then also like, I really enjoyed the filmmaking stuff aspect of it. And it was like my other friend Callum, who was was I'm still good friends with today. Um, he had this um like DSLR camera. I believe it was a a Canon five hundred D, which is like, you know, the knockout or the cheap the sort of basic version of like the the five D, which was like yeah. the revolutionary. And there's camera. the fifty D and then there's the five hundred, which is like the it was like the, the B-Tech version. Yeah, it was like the super plastic one, like did 720p video or something. And then like he brought that along once and I was just absolutely loving like just filming clips, you know, all this sort of stuff. Not for any, like like I say, it wasn't, there was no purpose. There was no like, oh, I'm going to get into film. I was like, I'm just enjoying this thing. We had the GoPros first and then it was like, now we've got the, the cinema camera. <laughs> do the do the tabletop and we'll get a clip of you casing it, you know, or whatever. Um, and then I just went from there to like, building out these edits and I, I remember it was like we'd go talk about it all week at school go up to Falkland f film on the Saturday and then I would edit it and get it out before Monday upload it just to Facebook and uh, then spend all week talking about the video and then plan the next one go up <laughs> shoot the next one and it was like that for like a good few weeks and we just made all these like Falkland bike park episodes with and then the crew just got bigger and bigger and there's like you know i think the credits on the second video there's like 15 people like we just all the people from school like were like interested in this concept of like coming to try and ride mountain bikes and like i didn't know anything about bass i didn't know anything about the bigger picture you know you just start watching stuff on pink bike and and yeah it's funny how like it was just such a holistic way to get into it there was no there was no thought you know it was it was so good so yeah, that's how it started. And then it went from there and it went like, then I started getting messages on the videos, like from people like, you know, Innes, who'd seen the thing and was like, I want to make a video. Um, and man, yeah, I think, who was the who was the first one? So it was like, there's one or two people before Innes that I shot with. It was a guy called Mitchell Skeen, who I ended up becoming really good friends with. Um, he was like kind of an SDA, like Scottish sick rider who had like gone to Europe and like I maybe done World Cups I can't remember we had this like sick specialized demo um and it yeah it just looked dope and we, we shot some stuff and then I think Innes saw those videos and then hit me up and was like we should sit something because he was also in in like the Fife like East Scotland area and um yeah what was like with Innes it was it's, it was like this um, evolutionary step in writing because we had I had all my mates who we rode with like from school like high school and then like filming with Innes there was just stuff that he'd like spotted on the track that we'd all filmed and knew so well that he was just 
suggesting things that like I couldn't I couldn't even imagine. So like there was, I remember one specific bit. There was this mini road gap. There was just like a fly off over like a a forest road, and we all just flew off and landed on the on the thing on the on the fire road because yeah. you know a bike length maybe. And he was like, "Yeah, I'll jump to like the banking on the back side of the road." And it was like I remember that was like some of the first stuff we filmed. And I was just like, "What? Like that doesn't even make sense." Um, and so it was kind of like I was sitting on this, you know, this edit, and I was like, "This is gonna, it's gonna blow people's minds here," because like the stuff that we filmed, and I was stoked on the shots and everything. Um, so yeah, that video was like, I guess the first one that I was like really stoked on. That was a match made in heaven because the I guess the unique thing about you is that you were uh, you were you were in the writing scene, and all your friends were into writing, but you. Like, how would you describe your writing ability at that time? Mm. Yeah, I'd say the progression of all of our writing was, like, quite equal until I got really interested in the filmmaking. Um, And then I would go up and I wouldn't even want to ride a bike. I would just want to film because I was, like, so excited by learning about that. Um, And so, it was, yeah, it was that thing where, like, you know, people started just to get better at writing than me. And, you know, the group that I was with we went out and rode a bunch and then as I started hanging out with more like you know competent riders then that gap became even bigger and bigger and then it was like you know it would be nuts for me well it felt like it would be nuts for me to like go and ride with Innes because he's doing this shit that like it's so far like out of comprehension to compared to what I was doing so it's like I yeah I almost didn't have that focus on riding and that sort of like created that separation which is interesting but you, that meant that you were willingly and happily honing in that craft of filming mm-hmm. whereas simultaneously like i was still doing both so your like sort of style of filmmaking got like super refined super quick but you had this perspective where you knew what the writers wanted to see mm. and that was why it worked so well like it's just important to know what to what to look for and you like you you had the vibes yes it's it's interesting because i was yeah like you say i'm like one of the few mountain bike filmmakers that's not like that sick on a mountain bike and i've I've, like come to terms with that and you know i'm enjoying riding now you know like when we're out in the in europe in the summer i was trying to get up onto like do gondi laps with the boys and stuff but i'm kind of doing my own thing but it's fine because i'm like enjoy i'm just enjoying learning and getting better at it so it's yeah, it's definitely it's definitely been it's definitely caused some problems over the years in terms of like biting off more than I could chew filming events. Um the the main example being I um I got invited so I by this point I'm we're skipping forward through my years a little bit, but like by this point I I'd been invited out to film the Trans BC like 6 day enduro race. Um and like I say I hadn't been riding very much. And I got this opportunity to to go to Canada to like film this sick event, and I was like, "This is going to be so good." But and part of doing that, you needed to like ride a six day enduro, which like by anyone's standards is pretty fucking hectic. And to go from to go from like not really riding, and I remember like I was like, "Right, I'm going to get an enduro bike, going to train." Got an enduro bike, like you know, through some of the people that I worked with, and then had like about two weeks. And I was just like out every evening trying to get better at riding. But how much better at riding can you get in two weeks having not had a trail bike for like several years, you know, like and then going immediately into this, you know, intense situation where you have to film and, you know, ride with a backpack. Like the 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 riding with a backpack thing is nuts. Yeah, like, well, I I was camera, a, big, a big one. Yeah, like, fill camera bag with like drone and all sorts. Hmm. It's like all the practice is almost out the window at that point. So that was yeah super challenging, and then uh, yeah, flipping ended up breaking my leg, which was pretty hectic, and that sort of was like a bit of a uh, a big moment in in my life in terms of like going from just you know making films and then breaking my leg and then trying to find myself as a person, like going to university and stuff and struggling with that, and it was a bit of a dark time, and um, but you yeah, know I managed to get through it, and then I think that's. Did I meet you before that trip or after that trip? That's what I was trying to remember. What year would your spectacular... Was it an over the bars? 
did it wasn't even an over bars it was like <laughs> it was flipping it was day six the last day the last trail on the last day and um it was like a steep kind of rocky off camber trail like steep shoots into like you know steep hillside cut into the hillside kind of track and because it was a live stage there was riders coming through and like i say novice rider here <laughs> in the rockies <laughs> with a camera bag on and uh, so i was just trying to like stay clear of people racing um and it was as simple as like rider coming up behind me hear the rider and then i'm like trying to get off get off the track but because it was so narrow i like dismounted like stepped off the bike basically but i was on the steep camber and then i, I basically stepped and like the ground was like two meters below me or like a meter and a half below me so i landed on my leg and it was just like straight like tib fib sounded like a branch snapping or oh. it was fucking it was just hectic and then i was like lying on my side because i had a big camera bag like that mm. well sorry like that <laughs> <laughs> and uh and yeah the guy stopped he's like you're right i was like oh, i think i'm I think i'm fucked it <laughs> you know kind of thing um and then you know i was sort of lay, lying on the ground on my side and you know instantly put my legs together to like straighten my leg out which is just not really to even think about but um yeah i was sort of like there for ages and then what ended up happening is like you know the the amazing you know um medic guys like these these mountain rescue like canadian medic guys don't mess about they're like on it so like within you know 10 15 minutes medic there t looking after me you know keep give me some reassurance and stuff and and then they're like yeah we're gonna have to heli lift you out of here so it was just like right big operation and then there was like a, a mad moment where it was like so there was like now by this point you know seven or eight people around me had been covered up by a tarp because i was all shivery like just some like shock you know and then they eventually got like you know the gas in there like laughing gas so i was like sucking on this sucking on this juice and it was like unreal <laughs> it was so good and it was so funny because i was like went from being like i'm in a terrible situation to like like i'm highs <laughs> which was like so weird because i'd i like, hadn't really experienced that before and then so i was just like quite merrily and there's a, i think there's a photo i was got to see if we can find out but i'm like i'm like <laughs> like this and people like packing me into like a stretcher it was like yeah, just a holiday full <laughs> yeah, just like yeah. keen <laughs> tourist it was like so silly um and then i remember it was like i had i literally had like an out-of-body experience on that because it was like it was just i felt like i was watching myself getting packed into a stretcher and going up on the heli but from a third person like i was stood mm. behind the crowd as they were sorting me out how weird is that uh, that's amazing I just it was a pretty surreal experience um but yeah the, the yeah the Canadian medical people are just they were so on it with that sort of stuff they they're all in the mountains and they know their stuff so I was able to get like you know the surgery and everything and get back to recovery but that that would have been 2016 that happened so that was kind of like the, the the crisis point but I can't remember if we'd met I think it was after. I think it I was. I think it was after because like, I think we knew about you and we'd seen the films and stuff, but I hadn't reached out because it was later when I decided to go to university that I was like, who's mm. who's local around the Dundee area? And then you were like, I, I reached out then. What was your What was your incentive behind going to university? Because wow. you had a bit of you've had a bit of a a journey to that point as well. Yeah, well, I finished finished up at college and felt really interested in sport in general and performance and saw a bit of a gap in terms of there wasn't that many uh, coaches and trainers working at the elite level to help elite performers and looking at Reese as well I was like it'd be sick to be able to work with with him and help him improve his performance somehow so kind of convinced myself as well that I need to go to university because like that was the that's the structure Ex yeah expected thing that's the system and uh so felt as though if i didn't i was somehow letting my parents down by not going mm. to university which is absolutely not true and i think there's a lot of people that are in university that shouldn't be in university that's a i'm a firm believer of that and uh but yeah got there and just sort of slowly over a two-year period i mean it was a great experience and it allowed me to introduce myself to you 
and uh, met Ryan Middleton as well, which we spent so much time riding TTRs. I mean, that was the real highlight of all that was like I brought my TTR Yamaha, it's like a little pit bike. And uh, he <laughs> had DRZ he, Wheelie Wednesday. <laughs> you had a I DRZ. was hyped on that video. Yeah. <laughs> and just, yeah, super silly, like um, razzing around with Ryan, like literally as much as we possibly could. Like I absolutely ruined that TTR over that like two summers, you know. And uh, I was the only person in the student halls share, sharing a uh, flat with eight people, shared bathrooms, and you're like in a shoebox sort of yeah. thing. Like it's a brilliant experience in a way because it shows you how you know, a different a different standard of living, I suppose. And uh, you meet that, so many. Is that like social calibration thing? That we again, were yeah, it's like, and I, I was in a flat full of gamers, which I was a bit of a nerd and a gamer, and I felt as though in a way like I fitted in with them and we were all just nerds and and uh, we would play a bunch of pranks on each other in the hall and it kept it entertaining but there's a lot of drinking and a lot of you know as things go in university so yeah it's a lot a bit of a roller coaster experience but the best part about all of that was meeting Ryan and, your, and yourself and making those connections whereas all the people I met at university I never clicked with anyone like I met I remember meeting you and being like I think I told you at the time I was like whoa that's just sick to talk to someone with like a similar mind because like mm. I was around all these people and I'm not necessarily saying that they were like not smart or interesting they just weren't the same they were people that wanted to be PE teachers people that wanted to be work in the public sector of sport and the whole course is not wasn't what I thought it was like I thought it was going to be learning about elite level biomechanics and like slow motion video and pressure plates and that's the stuff that I was like, that, that's quite interesting. Um, but it just wasn't, it just wasn't like that at all. It was, they were pushing you hard towards the public sector. There was this one day, it was absolutely terrifying because that you, as a, like a module, you got allocated a random school in Dundee. And if anybody oh, knows, no. <laughs> if anybody knows Dundee, they know that it's, it's rough. Like the, the majority of it is, is pretty, is pretty rough. It's a beautiful city, stunning city, and the center is absolutely stunning as well. Amazing culture, everything like that, but it's rough. And I got one of the roughest areas um, as my little allocation to go and teach kids football. And if anybody knows me, I hate football. Like I don't, I, I'm terrible <laughs> no. at football. Actually, I like playing football now for a laugh, but like historically in school, I was always picked last for the football team and stuff like that. Like I've just got these connotations with football. Um, and uh, I was just tasked with teaching these primary school kids football for a day and they were just rowdy kids that were so hard to control and I hadn't even thought about like controlling a class of kids that age. I thought about working with elite athletes and it was terrifying and like to, to control the kids like that when you're a substitute for the day they were running riot and I had to send one out and stuff and you know like try and like assert my authority but like I had no idea and then <laughs> eventually got them in a, in a way they were they were just kind of kicking balls around and having fun relatively within control and just sort of ran that out but anyway the course wasn't for me so one day I remember it was a slow slow sort of burn of like sitting on my computer at night making videos or playing video games like I played MX Simulator a lot and I would listen to loads of podcasts um, and lectures from like Alan Watts and really in Alan Watson, Terence McKenna at that point, like deep into their lectures. And I just sort of realized that I was learning a lot more sat at home on my computer than I was at university. And I was absorbing way more because I was actually interested in it. And then you would go to university and then like, they're just, they would be teaching you about something you just wouldn't care about. And just again, pushing you towards something you didn't want to do. So slowly start to realize like, if I've got the internet, like I can kind of do whatever you can do whatever you want like mm. there, there's no reason for you to be in this structure so i've got to say just there like with the with your listening to those lectures i feel like that was something that informed your early style of filmmaking because mm. you almost wanted your your kind of initial niche or like style was you know really cool writing but like with a bit of psychology or philosophy inserted with like use it was almost like hip-hop style like use of samples and it was just super creative and uh I, I, I remember like when you started doing more film stuff i was like pretty inspired by what you're doing because it, it felt so like you know it just felt free it wasn't like trying to 
I was getting really dialed into the cinematic. Every shot has to be perfect. And then I see what you're doing with your, you know, more like hip hop, like kind of punk style of videos. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, that's so cool. Cause it, you know, I hadn't seen that before. I was like, that's a totally different way of making a film. Like it's not go out and, you know, just simple narrative with like, cleanest shots you could imagine coolest coolest obviously the bike riding is really good and the shots are really good but like in terms of like a message or a, a thought-provoking thing that wasn't what i was interested in, in the beginning mm. and it's like i felt like that was where you started which is really interesting yeah i kind of had like almost like a like a, a complex where i felt as though if i was taking people's time why was i taking people's time if i was making you sit down for even if it was 10 minutes like I kind of almost overthought like compressing as much of a meaningful message into that period of time. So like over time I've sort of gotten less intense with that, but I do love that like deeper meaning, bigger message, something that's woven into it. And uh, yeah, I think sometimes it worked and then other times it felt quite forced almost. Um, not everything needs to mean a whole lot that was like a it's like a more mature realization that i, that mm. I came to but that's again I, I that's why i think we work so well together because those two styles like they make <laughs> that's the that's you need both of those to make a really really good film mm. um yeah i feel like i was i'd gotten so far down the path of you know clean shooting and everything which was great and then that was very commercializable and it meant that i had a lot of like you know business opportunities within filmmaking to like shoot you know events or i mean there's so many there's, i've done so many different kinds of videos and i've met so many brilliant people but it was it was like i felt like um i got you know like i said at the beginning i i really started this thing because i i wanted to do it and i wanted to like make things for my friends and then i got dragged like turning your hobby into a business drags you into doing work for like other people and not necessarily doing what makes you happy but then you're getting paid well mm -hmm. so you're making all these films over here you know getting paid well covering events you know all this stuff but that core like doing it for myself in the beginning was lost it was just gone and i was like well i'm you know i was through uni i was like doing my uni projects but always working on on you know this mountain bike filmmaking and like building that up as a career so when I left uni I was fortunate enough to be able to like jump right into that as like a a semi like full-time job as a freelancer but at that time there was there was you know so much work getting done on other projects and I I'd kind of lost the meaning of why I was doing it mm. um, yeah so let's just stay in this sort of little timeline of uni mm. because it's quite crucial I guess and uh, so like I'm over here and I've not I've not realized that I want to be a filmmaker yet. So I'm, I'm at uni, but you're at art school simultaneously. And you're making these films the whole time, all of my spare time, I'm making little GoPro edits and shred edits and fun stuff. And then one day I go into, go into university and it was like almost, as you say, like an out of body experience where the, the, the whole time I was sat in the lecture is just like tense feeling as though I don't belong here mm. and these aren't my people. And it's like isolating not, yeah like i felt so alone and you know living in the city makes it it creates that effect as well because that sort of isolation of just going to your room and there's loads of people everywhere but no one's talking to each other in the city it's a weird thing coming from the country so i just remember like i left the class and sort of just stormed out and just immediately started crying and just like i had this like realization that i wasn't supposed to be here and like it was super dramatic like you could actually make quite a dramatic scene out of it because I, I went went to the top of this open story car park on the roof and just sat on the roof crying like overlooking the uh the university just realizing like fuck i'm not supposed to be here this isn't it and in that in that moment that was it like i decided i was going to quit and i phoned uh, phoned my parents and said and they were disappointed but like supportive of mm. of the decision um and then i remember that was when the whistler trip that was described in the first thing happened. I finished uni and I actually did really well at the end because I let go of all the sort of weight of it. 
But I was like, I'm going to see this out. I'm going to like, you know, do these exams like to, my, to the best of my ability. And I did them and I got some of the best grades I got all year because of the lack of weight behind it. Mm. I was just like, I'm just going to see this out. So I got like B's and then uh, away to Whistler, which was like a life changing experience. And then came home and I remember just writing a list, super simple. And like, I would encourage people that don't know what they want to do to do this as well. And it just one column was things that I enjoy doing. Another column was things that I am good at doing. And then just sort of, and then things that I don't like doing and things that I'm really bad at as well. And one of those things that I was bad at was like kind of numbers and like that, I'd realized that through uni that I wasn't so good at just the data crunching or, you mm. know, like I'd be a terrible accountant as you know very well. <laughs> um, but then there was all these things like I like creating videos, like riding bikes. I like doing this and I da 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 da. And that's when through that list of things that I like doing and I'm good at doing, I formed the idea of, of, uh, of starting a, a film company and making films because I realized the entire time that I was doing anything, I was always making films. Mm. But meanwhile, whilst I'm kind of going through this topsy turvy thing, and then I get that's when I get the job for people's information of the timeline. It's like that's when I get the the plumbing job and then save up to buy the camera over a year period. But this whole time, you're making films professionally in a independent way. Mm. I was going to ask you because obviously you go to art school. I'm sure you had ideas about um, feature films and scripted films. And mm, good question. Yeah. So, what was your journey into? Like, why are you not now making like typical Hollywood feature films with actors? <laughs> That's a really great question. Um, yeah, I think it was that thing of like that pursuit of perfection. And, you know, I, throughout uni, I was like handed all of these creative briefs and I hadn't really put together the, the two and two of like m mountain bike filming and a creative brief. I'd kind of just like, I was doing the mountain bike thing and it was becoming commercialized and it was doing events and I just didn't, I never, I had so obviously some creative ideas and we, and one of them we tried to shoot, but it's like the, yeah, I was really set on like I got really into watching movies and, and I was really set on like making like a yeah narrative piece, like a, not a documentary, like a, a fiction. Um, and I thought that's what I wanted to do. I thought I was like, yeah, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to work through the ranks. You know, the, the goal is the Hollywood, you know, I want to be making these big feature films. And um, yeah, I kind of started that process and I had, had some brilliant people around me making that but what I've I found was that that process in itself was too restrictive and it was also I felt like it was so stressful because you do so much meticulous planning there's then every eventuality is thought of and then you have this like small block of shooting so you plan out every detail of the script you know you've got all your shots figured out everything and then you do this shoot over several days and it's like whatever happens in the shoot happens and then you've and then you've got to work with what you've got and uh and it's a weird thing i almost thought that like at that time being a documentary filmmaker was a cop-out mm. i was like that's not the real good thing like i thought i because maybe i hadn't watched that many documentaries or didn't really perceive the importance of it I thought the fiction was the thing and so I was like really trying to like force this fiction narrative into a style of filmmaking into into my life and it and it took me trying to do that really hard for me to realize that that didn't make me happy and it didn't I didn't get anything out of it like yeah I made a couple of kind of fun little short films and had a great time doing it but like it was weird. I don't know when the, the change happened when I was like, you know, actually documentaries are pretty good. You know, <laughs> I don't know when that happened, but it, it was a slow process for sure. And it was a lot of like self-doubt and because I'd kind of set that goal of like, I'm going to do feature films. Like I'm going to do write stories like script and direct and that stuff. But then a lot of those skills are transferable into documentary and like, and it can be, you know, you can craft a story out of a documentary. I think at the time, maybe I just thought like, oh, you just go and film what happens and piece it together later but like as you get more into it you you start to realize okay i can actually think about what story i'm trying to tell here and you can make it almost into a bit more of like a narrative like a premeditated narrative rather than just like 
go and wait and see what happens, you know? Um, I think maybe I just didn't know that. So that was like the sort of, yeah, the transition, I guess. Um, so yeah. in, in art school, you, you said that that was quite like a life-changing experience. Like what was it like in general, like what was... Mm. Well, what, art school, I mean, yeah, I went to art school and I met some, like some of my best friends that I'm still really close with today. And through that, like, I think at the time I was, again, this just like, it was almost just like, I didn't really know what art was and I didn't understand it and I didn't identify with it. And the only reason I kind of went there was because it did like, a, there was like an art film course and I was like, okay, that's like, you know, local enough to me that I can do my stuff and, and still like see friends and family, but then also study film. Um, but when I went to university, like <laughs> the, it could not be further from what I expected in terms of like the briefs were so open and I was expecting like a structured, like almost like a broadcast course or something where mm. like you would learn all the details of, you know, how this works and this works. And it was none of that. It was like, come up like in four weeks, come up with an idea about, you know, whatever. I, I, I remember one of the first, I can never remember what it was called, but it was so vague. And I was just like, is this a joke? Like, I'm not getting taught anything here. Like it, you just give you an open brief and you go to like some lectures about like, art history and it took a while to click and I think the realization I had was I was sitting in one lecture and I was like just sulking as usual and uh, I sort of had this realization is like that art is actually regardless of the medium is is a physical personification of your thoughts and that mm. was a sort of like mindset switch to use a Reese Wilson mannerism um <laughs> <laughs> yeah that was the switch going so it's like yeah like it's a, a physical per personification of your thoughts whether it be like a painting like you've got this idea and then you use the paints as the medium or you are a sculptor you've got this concept to represent something you do that and then like with the filmmaking it was like right physical personification so turn an idea into a, a, a tangible thing and when you start to think about art like that, then you can become way more engaged because you, you go and look at some art in a gallery or something. And before I would storm through the gallery, it'd be like, whatever. But then if you know a little bit about the artist or the philosophy or the mindset or what it's trying to say, then you start like looking at it and you're like, that's actually really clever. Or, you know, you're not supposed to like all the art. It's like, if you're watching films, like you're not going to like every film you watch. And it's like, if you go through a gallery and there's, hundreds of world-class paintings you might only identify with one of them but if you see that one and it's a banger and you're like that's so good then it's worth it you know so it's like that was the sort of yeah the, the realization i had at uni so it's like i became a lot more connected to the art world in that way mm. and i sort of seen that yeah just like yeah being more involved in the art scene like supporting local artists like you know some of my best mates like frankie dan james these guys are all amazing artists and like I love everything that they do because I know the stories behind it I know their philosophies I know like how they think and then when I see a piece of work that like for example James puts together like a really great painting and like you know he's picked all these amazing moments out of like you know things we've done together or things that's happened in his life and he's like collated it into a rad art piece and uh, like it has a big it's like a big story you know it's so cool so yeah that's amazing yeah and I think for both me and you we sort of arrived at almost accidentally on documentaries as like our like sleepers niches almost in documentaries now um and I think it's because it's the perfect marriage of like telling a real story because we're all into you know reality we, we like mm. working with a real story because it's just so much more hard-hitting especially if it's you know you could see us, you know, a sad story, but if it's not real, then it's it's not that sad. So it's almost that power behind working with like a real story that we're we're into. But also, as you say before, there's a freedom within documentaries to tell it the way that you want mm. and to express it in a way that best represents your interpretation of it. Yeah. And we've talked before about that kind of concept of humans are basically like antennas mm. for ideas and the ideas are out there 
and multiple people can tap into the signal and have the idea, but it's about who gets there first to Excuse. taking the signal and putting it into reality and sharing it with humans. And that's kind of like almost the purpose of being a human being is to, is to listen to your antenna, think about what that want you, you, like and express that and be a medium f for other people to get receive that signal too it's an interesting one and mm. yeah i think with the um that concept of like yeah ideas are just part of the universe and then like you know as you, you can receive an idea but if you don't act on it then a year or two later you might see someone else make that film or or do that thing or have that idea and act on it and you're like, I had that idea. It's like, it's not your idea. It's like, you it's know, just an idea. <laughs> it's an idea. And it, someone else is going to make that connection. Um, and I think that's what draw me, drew me towards working with yourself because it was, you had that inherent conviction to like, I've got this idea. I'm going to go and make this thing. And I think at that time when I was like, yeah, I was struggling to to act on that, like have the confidence to to just pursue an idea to its entirety because I was so caught up in all meticulous details that as soon as I started like working towards an idea, I had this like analysis paralysis. If you know, if you know, if mm. you've heard that before, where it's like you start pl planning it out and you start realizing the things that might be tricky. And then you just think, Oh, that's too hard. Whereas like I felt your approach was like, I've got this idea. I'm going to try and make it. I don't know how hard it is. I'm going to try and make it. And that was like super inspiring. And it's like, I think that's what works well now because I have that meticulous side and you've got that like, conviction element. Mm. And it's like, I feed off that conviction. That gives me more confidence as well to pursue projects and stuff. And then I'm like really good again, you know, picking up the slack where on things that you're like, you're not so good at. So and it's like, like being able to execute the idea to like a higher level like if you look at my early work like it's pretty jankily filmed <laughs> and you know i would in my head it was perfect it looked like clay porter you know yeah. so that's why it's amazing to work with you because y y we get closer to like what that idea is in the head mm -hmm. but now our, our ideas are kind of a little bit more shared and like our our goals are since we've matured are almost like they're their collective ideas rather than it just being one person mm -hmm. like we between me and you and and harry we all decide what we want to say and like and then go move towards that as a team and that's just so much more powerful because it's it's more important when multiple people think it's important you know um but yeah like a good example of that would be like flow state or something like that like that was my first film where i decided to be professional film mm. like that was my first ever like okay assignment idea try and do it and I, yeah just dm'd phil on uh on instagram and he was he was keen and just f flew me out there for pennies and uh and we did it i had audio prepped and i've actually never done that since like as I in had, like you had the songs already sussed yeah so that like sample if you watch flow state the start the the sample for the uh description of what flow state is and the track and the drop for the riding was already all there so like i, I sat fell down and i was like listen to this <laughs> and he was like yo that's sick <laughs> like you'd never heard someone prep like an edit before even shooting it yeah and i've never done that since which is interesting that's so interesting i was just like so keen to get that one idea and this is a great great time to say that we're uh planning to do a second flow state mm. this year which is so exciting yeah, that's been like a, a bit of a, a dream for yourself for several years. And it's like every year it's like slipped through the net. Mm. And it's just like, you know, that we've decided, yeah, we're going to we're gonna pursue that and make that happen because it's going to be so good. Like It's just you can't like do it like before. Like I didn't make any money on that shoot because I... <laughs> this goddamn story keeps coming up. <laughs> and I was going to tell it with Phil, but like I crashed Phil's moped when I was away. <laughs> shooting flow state with them um i went to do oh, i'll tell the quick version <laughs> so i went to yeah, film skim a, the details so you can keep the juicy parts with yeah phil. um i went to go film a time lapse up a mountain on my own took phil's scooter and then well, out, well as i was coming down the hill it got dark and i ran out of fuel had to 
push the scooter to a petrol station. By this time, it's completely dark. And then had to Google Maps my way back to his, missed the stop sign and got sideswiped by a a car, rolled onto the bonnet, smashed my head off off the bonnet, broke his, broke the windscreen and did a couple of tumbles in the air before <sighs> then coming to a rest. And there was just Phil's poor zip in absolute bits all over the road. <laughs> he, he had no. like stuff under the seat, like tools and wrenches and, yeah. you know, loads of bits and bobs that over the years for using that amazing zip r.i.p the zip and it uh it was never the same like my flip-flops were in like one was in a garden 20 meters that way another one was in another garden over there um and then like a few days later we were in maribor still shooting flow state and uh, like i felt like i had internal bleeding and uh went to the hospital i didn't have internal bleeding but it damn well felt like it oh, God. um that was gnarly. So yeah, I nearly died for that film. <laughs> but anyway, what were we talking about before that, that? That was you were just saying like you you made like we couldn't do Flow State two the same way because yeah, no making no money from it. Yeah, so Cube like last minute said like oh yeah like okay here's some budget you know they clearly hadn't allocated it for the year or whatever, and it was like it was like two hundred and fifty quid or something for the for the whole film. And uh, then I got some more because we decided to take continue on and take me to the to the mm. World Cup. So they they kindly threw in a little bit more, and it came to like four hundred or five hundred quid. And then I just bought Phil another scooter because <laughs> I'd crashed his scooter. So the whole thing was like a net a net negative um, for for profit. And yeah, it's just like as soon as you start to grow things out and work with people and. You, you realize that that's just not possible so yeah as you say like year on year it's been like let's do another one let's do another one and uh, we've never uh, gotten the situation to where that was possible in our current but we're still figuring that stuff out because it's like that mode of filmmaking like you know shoot the thing because you want to make it and then figure out the finance later it's like it's it's high risk you're sticking your neck out but then it's almost like it can be more rewarding because it's hard to sell like a concept to you know to a, a, a brand manager like they they're taking a chance on you every time they give you some money so it's like they're you know how are they how are they going to guarantee that they're going to get their money's worth on this project like at the end of the day they have to s promote their company sell you know get their numbers to take to their bosses so it's like we're over here with our big ideas but it's like yeah, that's something we're still navigating, but it's like, there's not to say that, I mean, some of the approaches we're taking now with certain projects is like, you know, we want to make this thing, we're going to make it. And then like later on, we'll, we'll try and sell it or, or see if anyone wants to support it once it's a bit further along the process of being made. Um, so there's, yeah, there's no one way to like run a, run a, I guess a video production company. There's like, yeah, you can do it in any sort of way, but luckily with the Phil project, like we've got some, we've got some, he's got some brilliant partners and is, yeah, it's all kind of getting planned out now. So very excited to, to see how that develops, um, in the coming time. Yeah. Um, I've, I've got a couple of just really mad questions. Okay. Hit me. So what is the greatest mountain biking film of all time? Oh, the first thing that came to head, honestly, the Connor fear and in the no video. No way. <laughs> My mind spark. Yeah, yeah, it was mind spark. That was like in terms of just the cleanest never seen a place. Yeah, like the this. cleanest, like just sickest. Yeah. Writing, execution of filmmaking. Like, okay, not a huge story, but it was a writing edit. But like that that was like big inspo. That only was huge. only a filmmaker would get so excited about uh, static shots. Yeah. Because they're all like most of them are static, right? Statics and then there's this like, you know, like two thirds of the way and it's like this long shot and he dips out of frame and then they rack the focus to like foreground and then he comes up through frame like doing a big steeze and you're just like, Oh god. Like they That's must amazing. have planned that out. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it's like that that wasn't by chance. God, I've watched that a lot. It's such a good edit. Like it's and it's that thing is like, you know, I was I even though I wasn't doing much mountain biking, I was like so in the the mountain biking community. Like I was, you know, pink bike was a huge, hugely competitive thing for me. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't racing SDAs, but I was going after the I bots. A, I had a physical altercation <laughs> with pink bike. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't doing the local races, but you know, bet your bottom dollar, I was trying to get a flipping video of the day. 
And for people, you know, who don't know what a video of the day is, it was it was this silly thing where Pinkbike did like a little spot spotlight on like a cool video that had been uploaded to the site, and they also had a picture of the day. And you know, once I started getting into the more mountain bike filmmaking, I was like, you know, I was going after it. I was that was my that was my target. You know, make the cleanest edit video of the day, like video of the day, like that's like boom. You know, it means a lot. Because uh, at the time, like that was pink bike was like kind of one of the main outlets for mountain bike content. Well, it was kind of yeah, except from Vital, it felt like it was the only one. The pink bike audience for me was was so um, you know so much like more active, and you know I'd post something on pink bike and it would maybe get you know five ten thousand views, but every single person watching that video is a mountain biker. Mm. So in terms of how I thought about that in terms of YouTube, it was like I'm getting a lot more like meaningful views and comments because people are actually mountain bikers and this video of the day like it kind of at that time it was peaking because all of the good videos mountain bike videos were uploaded to pink bike like that was just the thing to do um or yeah vital as well i don't i don't want to just uh discover i know but yeah pink bike had that integration there the comment section the 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 native video uploader um they had the articles you could write and you could upload some photographs and then you had the chance to get it on the home page and like, yeah, I, I think also the reason it was Pink Bike as well was because we were all buying and selling our bikes on Pink Bike, which yeah. is another brilliant aspect. service that they so, had. Yeah, they, so like for me, it was like Pink Bike was the was kind of the website. Um, and so, yeah, with this video of the day thing, and I was like trying really hard. Like every edit, I would upload it, try and like take some pictures as well to make a vlog, like I'm writing a blog post and pure like Pink Bike news, you know, the guys are probably receiving this like... 16 year old kid like trying to write like an article about a video he made and i was just like i made this video at Falkland, <laughs> you know, whatever yeah. but yeah it was one of those things and it was i never got a video of the day so like it was you know this unreachable target and i was just, it was in the back of my mind all the time you know when i was i was like is this the one is this going to be the video of the day and it was the ryan middle and callum mcgee of oh, to the crowd we're gonna need the high res for that to play we're like, gonna I we're gonna need that video so that that video was really oh sorry my laptop's doing things um hang on. the that video really was like you know <laughs> my flipping magnum opus of uh of mountain bike edit at the time <laughs> like i was like i'm i'm gonna and i remember we shot this over like four or five days and and i was so in the details of the edit it took me like six months to edit that thing did six months it's like yeah. a two minute video oh i remember ryan complaining <laughs> a, a ryan, man. Hey, he's, he's filmed this <laughs> friggin edit and he's <laughs> the clips won't be good anymore <laughs> yeah because yeah, yeah, he was like worried that that is a thing when you're a writer and it takes so long for something to get released that you feel like you've moved past it and you've gotten so much better that you won't be able to watch the clips anymore yeah, sort of thing. I totally understand and empathize. And I was just so, like I was saying, I was so in my head at the time, every detail, you know, and I would edit it and re-edit it. And it was like, a, it was painful because I was expecting this video to be so good. You know, the expectation was like, Dang. and I was like, what if the clips aren't good enough? And it would take <laughs> me so long to even watch them because I was like, what scared if, of watching yeah them. i was like I've, in my head i'd built this up this is the video of the day like the pressure is enormous i know some people are doing like world cups and that but like pff, you know the like, video of the day <laughs> in my head i'm yeah. like this is like this is world champs you know <laughs> <laughs> there's stripes out there for me yeah and uh yeah anyway like managed to put the video together finally after ryan badgering me probably every day for about six months and um yeah it's pretty good <laughs> but what it did get was video of the day yeah and that was can you remember when you like found out that it got video of the day i i don't know if i can remember the day but i remember it was like pop it was popping off people were liking it i, I think it uploaded to youtube as well and people were really stoked on it i was stoked on it and like song was banging everything was good and then i think it got video of the day and i was like really stoked i was so just delighted because i was like there we go that's the goal you know and then the cherry on top was so beyond video of the day you, there's video of the month and then there's also video of the year mm. 
Um, and obviously, I my first goal was video of the day, but like you know, I was like, I'm never gonna get video of the day, year. Like the, those videos were like Brett Reeder, like at Crankworks yeah, winning or whatever, yeah. or Seminac or. So I had I hadn't really thought about that, but I ended up getting video of the month as well. So it wasn't just a vod; it was a vom. Yeah, yeah, I remember <laughs> yeah, that. That huge. So yeah, that was my um, that was my big that was my big target when I was coming up in the game. That was like. You know, that was my first big win in this space. <laughs> that is amazing. Um, yeah, that that pink bike was the was the was the place to be. Me and Reese used to sit in school. We would be in school, and uh, just refresh the videos page because he had like home videos, photos. Yeah, just refresh the videos page. So we'd be watching some obscure edit from like in the middle of Canada somewhere, and someone's built like a sketchy offshore thing <laughs> and made like a like a <laughs> sketchy edit to it. Just couldn't get enough, and uh, yeah, there were so many discoveries through that, and that was it. So how do you how do you feel now that we're like, because it's almost like you do video of the day, video of the month, but now we're generating Pink Bikes like premium uh, documentary series. So how does how does that feel? Have you even, have you even thought about it? I have reflected on it a little bit because I remember this goes back to like you know catching up with old friends who I I used to ride with, and we used to like nerd over pink bike and then you know telling them that oh yeah i work for pink bike now like you know we're, we're making films in partnership with pink bike uh it's it's quite surreal you know like um yeah like early friend callum who I'm still good friends with today like he i remember telling him and i just think he was just like man that's so sick like you've made it you've done it and like you know you you kind of just you you forget that like imagine telling 16 year old kid like oh yeah in, in five ten years you're going to be they're going to be your client yeah it's like that's nuts like i couldn't have imagined that um it's a, yeah it's a, it's 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 kind of mad it's wild like i how do you feel like you must feel you must have a similar sort of thought like it's all happened so naturally that it's not mm. felt like i've gone after this target and i've worked so hard for it it's just kind of like one thing led to another and now we're we're here like it, it it wasn't like pitching for months and like battling for years to get this contract no it, it happened almost instantly because of ben cathro and uh yeah just made a i remember approaching him just had nothing to do thought i want to make a video of ben cathro so we made the it's called uh downhill savagery <laughs> that's a banger I, yeah <laughs> it's on uh it's on the sleeper youtube and yeah. uh it's just him riding his bike and talking about the new v10 and stuff like that and uh made that and then a few months later i thought ben's really good at coaching mm. there there isn't really that many good coaching videos and i was like surely pink bike would be interested in some coaching videos mm. so then i phone him uh, i get his number and phone him and he's like oh yeah oh yeah sounds sounds good but i've got a better idea I was like, right? What's your what's your better idea? Is like, do you do you want to come and film me race World Cups? Mind, I was like, you, mind blowing. Are you joking? <laughs> yeah. He's like, I'm going to return to World Cups. I'm going to return to downhill racing. And it was weird because I phoned him, but then he had this idea. So it was like, why? You know, he'd never approached me, but I picked up the phone to talk to him about coaching videos, and he was just like, Nah, we're going racing. And then that That's was it. Amazing. That must have been like, pff, right. Yeah, that's a change of plan. <laughs> life, literally life changing. Yeah. and then that was like that was walk the talk and yeah. Christ, yeah, what what a life changing roller coaster. Um, and by this point, we're not really sort of like directly involved with each other. We're talking to each other all the time. And I think the idea had been talked about of you coming to work um, with Sleeper, but you were working for um, was it Cut Media at the time, or was it? I think it would be cut media because you'd be in, in Glasgow mm. and a few times yeah. I came over at your house and was just like, you need to sack that off and come work me. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, it's that conviction that we're talking about. Yeah. And yeah. So went, went the whole year with the walk the talk thing. And then that was a natural evolution. Like pink bike really liked it and we're super supportive. And then the pink bike racing thing happened. And by that time you're, you're fully on board. Mm hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think what happened was it was like the the Walk the Talk series and then it was, we did the the little intro skit, you know, the the heist sort of make, yeah, the, yeah. make like the, the crew coming together <laughs> and like 
Reese's dad's workshop and uh, <laughs> just the get the biggest smoke machine you can yeah, buy yeah. more smoke machines <laughs> more smoke <laughs> I'm pretty sure we have a group chat called Smoke Machine because yeah, it was do. just so much smoke. Um, Picky Blinders, like inspiration, so funny. And then yeah, like there's the there's the Easter egg that I'm actually in that video, but nobody would know. I'm in the background of one of the shots, and we planted that because I'm I really am the sleeper of sleeper. <laughs> <laughs> like, if you look closely, you'll see me. But yeah. I'm you know I'm yeah. always like lurking, yeah. just scheming in the background. <laughs> um, so that's like quite funny that I'm like in there, but. Yeah, I think it was the following year you you were like, was it just, was it, because you started doing more of the coverage stuff with Ben, and then there was, like that year that I came on to do the, to the first season, that was 21, mm-hmm. um, but I don't think there was a, a race, a race diaries, like, doco series planned, mm. it was just coverage, we didn't do any bigger doc stuff at the time, um, so it was just like coming to the World Cups, but then, you know, during that time we'd also kind of like, planned the f- to do to document Reese, you know, yeah, and I think that was part of the objective as well. It was our idea, like, you know, Reese is coming back off the back of being world champion. What's his year going to look like, you know? And and we'd missed the boat on doing a story about Reese's world championships, so it was kind of like, right, well, what's next? What is he going to do next? And we were just interested because it's like, you know, like like it says in the, the Flying Scotsman film, like. He'd won both times he'd competed in 2020, that being like world champs and then qualifying of the next again round before crashing. So he was like feeling good, but then he had this bizarre, huge off season. So we were like interested to film that. And so I think maybe that, that was part of it as well. It was like you wanted to, wanted to have a focus on that, but also help with the coverage. What was Ben doing? Was Ben not racing and just doing coverage? No, he, he rode a couple of times. Remember, he got like a equality in snowshoe and stuff. I know this is probably just dire yeah. chat for the for this going to get cut. Yeah, the thing, but we're just kind of like like he was racing, but there was no series to go with it. Mm-hmm. Ben's Ben's racing, and then twenty two, it was like there's a team. Yeah, they're good. Pink Pike are planning to make their own race team, and it was just like that was kind of a. Somebody commented it on the Jamie Emerson video because it just seemed like anyone that Ben helped did really well. <laughs> you know, it was just like Fortune was was uh, was on uh, on our side. So yeah, Jamie Emerson came on and had a podium um, with us helping him out, and everyone was like, Ben should have his own team. Mm. And there was a few of those comments, and then I found it interesting that Ben didn't really. He was like, oh, it's just luck. Like, just put up a easy up and just let them crack on. But like, there's an untangible thing with Ben when you hang out with him. He, he's just so he makes you feel at ease and he's so supportive and he, he listens and it's like you you know what you see in the videos is is what he's like he's he's very like he's got this amazing aura around him he, he just brings this like playful fun laid back element to everything like and you always have a funny conversation with him and he always like has a little joke or you know and it's i think there's there's something to be said about you know as much as he was just stuck an easy up up like being with Jamie Edmondson like you know having a bunch of Scots around Jamie must have in his head put him at ease like you know I'm just racing with my mates like it was back home it's like there's something to be said about that I think totally it's going to be cool to see what Jamie gets up to this year and mm. um, with his new with his new program mm-hmm. wish him all the best that's he's had a bit of sort of string of bad luck and it's not quite put it together the same way and, yeah, uh, I remember speaking to him at one of the last rounds and, and you know, he was just talking because everyone's like talking to brands and stuff like that. It's like, oh, what's your program? He's like, yeah, well, I've just had the worst season of my life. So like, we're going to see what's happening. So it's really great that he's still able to do the downhill racing. And that touches on like, the, you, know, you know, how savage the sport is. Like, you know, people like Jamie going from like a, a really sick factory setup, all the support, you know, EWS winner to like have I got a job next year it's like mm. that's ruthless it's it's nuts you know like and imagine imagine being imagine doing any occupation and doing like you get this high level job and then you just let go and you're like I need to find another job it's like it, it, that it, anyone can relate to that you know totally and it's interesting how the paint bike article that just got released about the rider's opinion of the new move to discovery Mm. yeah so and the kind of the 
anxiety that some riders have. And I think they made a good point in the Pink Bike article that the riders who are feeling uneasy about the situation are the ones that will be on the edge of actually even having a ride, of course. Mm-hmm. And because all, all like these changes, like there are being a semi-final, the, the final only having 30 people in the top, mm-hmm. that's worrying for someone that's struggling to make the top 60, of course. So it's natural that there's always going to be like a a pessimistic sort of emotional response to that for the people involved in it because it means so much to them. And uh, for sure, it's like, is the semi final going to be seen the same way as the final was? Like, if you made it into the live show in the final, like, big win, you know? Mm. But like, if you make it into the live show at the semi final, is it going to feel the same? You know, are you going to, you know, is that going to feel like? What's the what's the views going to be like? Is that going to give me the same exposure? But it's 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 more op- for us. Like I, I don't know how you feel about it, but I'm quite excited because mm. I like change. I like novelty. I like all these things. Um, but the story points that come from having more uh, points of the journey. So like you've got your qualification, and then you've got your semi final. Now say just as a random example, Ronan Dunn fastest time in semis like he's looking absolutely tapped and then in finals he uh i don't know snaps his chain out the start or something like that it's that like oh he was like his time in semis was faster than the time that Mm. won finals or something like that so there's more like oh it could what could have been you know so that in terms of storytelling and everything like that and the the more coverage and the more footage that's going to be of the run is something that excites me as mm. a filmmaker and a storyteller missing any part of the and i think red bull did a fantastic job and hats off to everything that they've that they've done but that moment in 2020 when reese won uh, worlds and there was no footage of his race run that's kind of unacceptable when it when it comes to like a, elite level sport like that's so unhelpful for mm. for everyone like that's that that does not help the situation at all that was like a waste of an opportunity to tell that story and to elevate that that uh, moment and therefore elevate the sport potentially so to Uh, what what was just to give people context what was the reason why there was no coverage of race reese's race run yeah well they like red bull have to deal with x amount of riders qualifying they can only film so many so reese qualified way down Mm. he had a terrible qualification run so you just you just passed the quality, so yeah. he was like you know within the top sixty, but not near the sharp end. Exactly. So right. when you switch on the live stream, you you start, you know, at X rider. You don't see everyone before, but then you might see them on the hot seat. Yeah, yeah, so that's that, true. And then they maybe play a highlight or something of yeah. like the previous. But then they start at top thirty, don't they? In terms of the live feed itself, mm-hmm. you start at top thirty and then you run through. But then all the the other thirty have already done the run. Yeah, and then there's and sat. you get some footage, but not all of it. And Reese just happened to, you know, be in the unlucky. I think there was a. I'm not saying that this is fact, but some of the riders even get like just kind of randomly dropped because there isn't enough space. In well, they, terms yeah, of like, they they don't they're not going to be able to broadcast that footage in the show. Mm-hmm. So it's like, in terms of like da- data management, simply data management. I know it sounds really ruthless, but it's like, if you're filming every single detail of every single rider, like that's the best ideal for that's the ideal scenario for like you know if if a mad thing happens like reese winning worlds mm-hmm. when he was not put down for that yeah um it's 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 like kind of no one's fault but in terms of an outcome like that's definitely something that i know for a fact that discovery eso are looking at and they're they're mm. going to try and make it so that every single part of the track is documented and i think that's super exciting it's yeah. super important for the sport, but that means, as a result, that you have to uh, make the field smaller because there isn't enough time to show everyone's run from top to bottom. So why that? Then this is why you're seeing that compression of the, the the top end of the field from from that perspective of we need to do better at documenting the top performers, and that, as a result, through no malice, means that those that are maybe just scraping the top 60 are not going to get the the same amount of limelight 
Yeah, but I believe that the, but I think I think they're they're working. They're obviously aware of that issue, and they're working to allow the opportunity for people to get that limelight because the way the semi final works is they're gonna have well. I mean, this is it's kind of speculation because we're I've I've not I've not I don't know the, every intricate detail. I've just from what I've read up and heard is like the the semi final race on this on the on the race day morning. There's the top sixty riders who've qualified. They will run the semi finals race. All sixty riders will get a live feed spot. Then that that might be a compressed version. You might you ne- might not get every shot on the hill. Yeah, but, but you then, might get like, oh, this guy had this moment. Yeah, but or... then, but then, like in the in the finals later in the day, then you go back to that, you know, more Red Bull style top thirty riders get the finals show, and so in a way, I feel like you might the, those top sixty riders might get more coverage because, like we said, when Red Bull switched to the top thirty riders, you don't see the previous thirty, you never saw them. You maybe saw one or two clips, but whereas if they've got a whole morning to show the top sixty riders in their entirety i don't know how they're going to program that with like the timing and stuff but okay maybe you only see half of the shots down the hill but still you're still getting more time for your you know your unexpected riders or your riders who are like building up to to get and breaking that top 20 top 30 like they're still going to get their semi-finals moment Mm -hmm. and then the top 30 finalists will get a full show finals every all the details exact etc the question comes like how I know they're they're trying to balance out the points at the moment with like having um, semis be quite high value in points. So how is the audience and sport going to perceive semi final? How important are people going to make it feel? Like are they going to want to watch the semi final because it's going to be like a lot of action in there? And I think that's what they're doing with the high point system, like to make people want to watch the semis because then you know, like, man, he had a bad run in semis, but he can pull it back in the finals. But then you know. It's over. It's basically like a two-run race instead of a one-run race. So, there's also does that take away from like the spectacle and the the drama of one chance? Mm. Pam's a sweaty, you know. Yeah, arm spaghetti. <laughs> Mum's spaghetti, you know. <laughs> or or is it like over two two races? Two um, you know. So it's interesting. It's yeah. I it's, think it's interesting. They did the kind of breakdown of screen time from other sports, and uh, one thing that is ESO's responsibility is to help fix the fact that the amount of screen time that each of these athletes is on screen is insanely small in comparison to other sports. For example, golf. You imagine how long a golf athlete is over a live stream is on screen. No helmet. No helmet. Personality shown. T-shirts, sponsors, clubs, all those things are on screen. Tennis compared, match. I think it worked out in mountain biking. So it's like, it was like half an hour. It was like twenty six minutes over a year. Wow. Now I'm sorry, that's not a good sell. That's mm. not a good sell to anyone. Like, imagine your Volvo. You want your you want your Volvo logo on for as long as possible on the screen. Twenty six minutes over a year period is not a reason to invest all your capital into. Mm. So that is what they're working hard to do, and that is the reason for the semi-final it's the the all of their efforts are pointed towards elevating the sport to a new level at new heights and bringing it to new audiences yeah, which is exciting. what's going to happen but there's this underlying belief from the wider community that somehow it's going to be worse because it won't be the same and i, I think, think that's very short-sighted i think people are just scared of change it's like you know you're thinking about quitting your job but oh, i don't know if it's going to work scared of change it's this you're just you know what's comfortable and and it's a human it's a very human reaction i think to the the audience it's like it's it you know this change it's like will it be as good of course it's going to be as good like these guys are experts they've they've run the enduro series for several years made an incredibly successful series out of that built that into a, a world-class sport from nothing over a period of five years like now they've got the whole roster of forecast sports. Now they're going to take that and they've got amazing partners. They're going to take that to the, the whole world and, and have it sat up there with the Tour de France. I think that's, it's really going to elevate downhill mountain biking, I think. It's going to turn it from this niche sport into this mainstream, like almost like downhill ski racing. 
like I was watching the the Ski Sunday, and if anyone's in the UK and, and is interested in skiing, like they they'll know Ski Sunday. It's like a, a, a like a recap show of the races that have happened on Sunday on the BBC. Everybody that I know who's interested in outdoors and sports watches Ski Sunday. They've got the iconic theme tune, and you know that's skiing. And they've got ski racing, downhill racing, cross country racing, snowboard, freestyle, everything on that show. And it's like you could I could easily imagine like a mountain bike recap show where you're learning about all the disciplines, these character stories, the, the little spotlights. It's like the possibilities are endless. And I think at the end of the day, it's like, yeah, I'm I'm trying to think like Red Bull. I mean, you've got to give them credit. They they took this relatively new sport and did an amazing show. And you know free for all the audience and stuff like that so it's like you've got to give them credit for that but like where it's going is it's gonna there's gonna be more money in the sport athletes are gonna get paid better you know more opportunities for us to tell these stories you know and it's it's gonna turn it into a, a bigger sport and and be better for everybody i think yeah, that's like, the vision they've got and that's what people are worried about but it's like you know, once it starts happening, then I think it's going to ease the tensions. Totally. And, you know, the lack of communication was definitely not helping as well because they're so busy setting everything up. Like They've got so much and, on their plate. Yeah, and a, and a lot is, is still, it's fluid as well. Like there's still ongoing discussion, discussions to do with points. There's ongoing discussions to do with protected rider status. Like that stuff is still up in the air at the moment and people don't understand how uh, difficult it is to try and make the best decision for that like you have to feel for whoever is trying to make that decision and you know trying to portray the sport in its best light still give the people a pathway into the sport for your next emerging talents mm. something that i'd hope to see in the in the live show or something is is showing a rider that it's surprising that they made it in so mm. like highlighting the fact that this person's made it into the final for the first time, you know, I'd love to see that as, you know, this is kind of what our company's about. It's about sort of bringing light to otherwise unseen stories and characters. And yeah, I'd love to see that, like a little highlight of like your random guy from Italy who works in a restaurant wearing the jeans. Like if he makes the final, let's make a big deal out of that. Like that's amazing. Let's. Let's get an interview with him and ask him about how stoked he is to even be in the in the top 30 for the final and how big a deal that is for him. Mm -hmm. I'd love to see that. One question I've got. How do you think... <laughs> this is a really uh, interesting question. How do you think um, like it will change people's goals? Like I'm thinking specifically about like Ben Cathro, for example. Like How do you think the running into the final, semi-final... Like, for a rider like are they i guess it's still trying to get to the final but if you can get i don't know that's kind of a weird question but well, we should ask him on next episode of sleeper podcast there we go. yeah that's what we'll, um that's what we'll do. I, yeah i don't know that was i was kind of i was i thought no, i, I know a profound mean, thought but i was like it's gonna be interesting to see how like your ben cathro's approach I and mean, it's gonna mm. be interesting to see how every rider project if they've got two race runs in one day then that's like how do you how do you charge that for that how it do definitely you for that? encourages more consistency and more like less kamikaze one run sort of behavior mm -hmm. which i think is quite interesting you know at scottish downhill races you do two race runs mm. and so, so what's the mindset with that then with two, like when you're doing a scottish downhill like i don't what, know i think it's different it, from it, like local level to high class like you know no, but you but come on you were kind of like a big oh, a I'm hot a shot huge, huge player at the <laughs> stas you're <laughs> kind of a hot shot i heard you got to expert oh man i got to expert went back and sandbag senior <laughs> <laughs> um no but at that level like for me at least like you do your first run and i'm like amping because i'm like i need to do that again like i didn't get that perfect yeah uh, yeah yeah so i'm ready to go again because it's that's the first time that you, you practice and it's, i suppose they do have qualifying as well but like that semi will be the first time that they try and put down their hottest time mm -hmm. and everyone every rider will find imperfections in their in their run and so to have the opportunity to go again, I think it's quite exciting. But some of the riders are seeing it as they're just making us do it twice. They're yeah, like, and it's, it's like twice as much work. Twice as much risk. Twice as much risk. At race speed, like you're, you're putting it on the line. But I think what ESO and Discovery are suggesting, or more just ESO side, that's kind of their responsibility, is that, that the evidence does not suggest that that's the case. 
So they're analyzing data and trying to come to the best decision. And from their perspective, there's nothing to indicate that doing two runs in a day is any more dangerous than doing one, which is very interesting. And it's something that I'd like um, somebody from ESO to come on the podcast and confirm and talk us through because we're, we're just kind of speculating off of whispers that we hear. Mm. And, you know, we're not that involved in any of these conversations. Um, we know very little, but a couple of things we've heard about. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it, I don't know what we're like to say. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like because you hear rumors and you're like, it might be true, and that might be NDA. I don't know. Yeah, it's like us saying about the the live feed. Like nobody knows what it looks like until we see it. You know, yeah. we've not seen the plan, the content plan for it. Um, it's just this rumor mill grapevine. Yeah, which is part of the reason why people are so nervous about it because it's just. Can yeah. we also touch on? I mean, I know it's a bit of a loaded topic, but like, can we also touch on like, what does it, um, what how does it how does it make people feel when it was free and now it costs money? I guess because it's kind of unannounced, people like there hasn't been like a press release to say it's going to be available here, 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 here. But I think people are going to be very surprised at where it's available. But my argument has always been that I don't know why people are so upset to pay. Like if you enjoy watching the sport like i bought the supercross uh pass Pass. so that was like 119 dollars for the whole season and you get access to all the live feed and everything like that like that (laughs) that seems completely worth it to me i get so much out of that in terms of entertainment value and to be able to see it live and to just generally support this the 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 sport and that service that they're providing like i see absolutely no issue in that but then i'm on the side of you know we're a production company So, you know, it's almost that understanding of how much effort and time goes into creating content in the first place, whereas other people just see the content and there's so much of it available for free. They say, why do I need to pay for that? I say, well, (laughs) because there's like thousands of people behind this production that have gotten it to this stage and all of those people need to live. So, Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, Yeah, I think it's a trick one one because it's like, you know, the people who are, you know, on low income and with all the, the you know, the, the current climate, it's like, you know, six pounds for a, a monthly subscription can mean a lot to people. I'm mm. just like, for them, it's, they're like, ah, oh, you know, I love watching the sport, but now it's super tricky. And then if they don't see that money going directly to the athletes that they mm. love, then they're like, well, I'm not, this is not, I'm not paying this to the athletes. And so they're, they, there's a divide there. And it's like, I think it all just needs to get explained and, under like it just needs to have a bit more transparency so it's that it's that age-old thing of like you start overthinking when you don't hear anything you start coming up with theories um but as you say as like you say like it's a whole industry and and everybody that's working in it's working super hard and they all care about downhill (laughs) so it's like maybe you know like the fact that a large network like warner brothers discovery of of seen downhill having that potential i think is amazing like we've obviously done a good enough job so far with the coverage we've done and everything that people have put into the sport that is now seen as like a serious enough sport to be like taken to this new height which i think is is it's great for downhill do you think it has that like potential to be that new spectacle that everyone gets into I think so. I it's we always joke. Well, we always say it's like it's the downhill. Uh, it's the Formula One of mountain biking. Downhill is the Formula One of mountain biking because it's that spectacle. It's the fastest ride down the hill as fast as humanly possible. If it's green, he's ahead. If it's red, he's down. You know, it's anyone can watch that and understand that. It's uh, whereas the nuance of like you know wheel to wheel racing in uh, cross country, it's like. You need to, like I remember watching a few cross country races like over the past few years, and I don't have very much to do with that sport. And I've I found it like I was starting to pick it up, but it takes a while to like get into the details of like who's ahead because they're all racing next to each other on the same track. So you like some some people might be like letting lapped, and it's it's hard to see. You know, well I don't know. I don't want to talk down on talk down on. I'm just saying what I was trying to say is simply that downhill is quite easy to understand and it's a spectacle and it's currently being viewed less than cross country and that people from our perspective we don't understand why that is yeah I, well i think it's the it's like it's the most it's like a niche extreme sport currently mm. that is you know cross country is in the olympics downhill isn't in the olympics 
Hmm. Because there's that endurance fitness athlete element, but then, you know, with downhill, you, to be the fastest in the world, you have to be like an athlete, a serious athlete. I think that's another th- point that just isn't well enough explained, and we see this all the time, and it almost it frustrates the life out of us to not see um, some sort of program that people are being translated exactly how hard this is and you know being put into perspective it's even like the steepness of the track like it never gets translated to to picture like you you can never do it unless you're stood there and and you're trying to walk down this hill and you can't walk down it and then they're going down this insane boulder rock garden after a a four and a half minute continuous squat and press up for the for the whole time and unless you kind of are there in person you don't realize how ludicrous this is and Mm -hmm. you know it's it's that the terrain is the terrain (laughs) like the (laughs) huge helmets (laughs) like in motocross oh god motocross is so gnarly but there's no rocks there's hardly any rocks there's no trees for you to so once you get there in person and see that you're just like what but i'd love to be able to explain to people how hard physically it is and you know in the current format there just isn't enough time to explain that and there there hasn't historically been the budget there to create a series in which you could go in depth about each and every one of these little nuanced details and translate that to a wider more mainstream audience so that they understand the how gnarly it is and how how fit the people need to be and the mental strength that you re- require and the differences of the characters between the riders mm. and you know why the french are so dominant and everything like that i was going to ask you about like the characters within the sport mm. and like what are some of your favorite characters because we're, we're we're talking about like you know if the sport does get elevated to that sort of level like w- what are the characters we- that you would like to hear more from who are some of your favorites? And why are the French so goddamn fast? <laughs> <laughs> uh, wow. I mean, there's a lot of amazing characters. I think one of the things that's interesting about what we're doing with the coverage is that historically we've just been filming everybody. And um, you get to know the writing styles of the characters and you start to identify with like, oh, this guy's like a bit of an underdog, but like I want to see him do well just by being there on site he's always killing it or she's always killing it you know it's like it's, it's interesting i think one of the people that i would like to know more about is benoit Coulange mm. because i always see him and i think he he was like you know in 2021 he came like second at world champs and the whole year i'd been like seeing him and, and you know he's got this like kind of unusual writing style i think he's just got like in terms of his posture he's got like long arms so he's got this a bit more like kind of like yeah, like, he's almost like skiing with his upper body. Yeah, it's he's interesting. Got super active hips. And and, uh, and uh, I really rate his riding style. And I'm like, come on, Ben let's do it. And then he like came, I think came second to Val de Sol. Uh, it's not very often talked about either. Like, is it's that whole you know he's not the best at, at English speaking English. Mm-hmm. And uh, the reality of the situation is that if you don't speak very good English, then you just don't get the same amount of coverage. And so that's why he's kind of interesting to us because he's kind of flying under the radar a little bit because, and he's always there or thereabouts. Mm-hmm. He's always doing bits. Yeah. Um. So yeah, he's he's one that I, I find I'd love to learn more about because I just think he's interesting and um, you know, it's but like it's so hard to pick, you know. Obviously, all the people in our immediate circle, all the Scottish people. At, wow, all the Scottish people are so good. Like they they are really just ele- <laughs> <laughs> elevating the sport. But it's like it's kind of like you know Scotland's a really small country, but very patriotic, and we kind of like love as a part of like our humor. We love just being really patriotic. So you know, every time you see Michaela Parton or you know any or Br- William Brodie, it's always like Scotland <laughs> <laughs> on track. <laughs> and then you know, like everyone else coming down the hill and like stopping and. Um, you know, if I see Reese stop down the hill, I'm like, "Hey, what are you doing?" <laughs> <laughs> like, it's not. It's so like it just the barrier is just broken. It's down. It's like disarming kind of humor yeah. that all the Scots people can relate to. So, like, I guess for us, like with our immediate circle, like you know, British riders, Scottish riders, like you know, we we love seeing that. And, and it's the same. It will be the same for the French. Like, 
they're all yeah. shouting at each other trackside and then you know french fans are shouting at the french riders in that same sort of disarming like we're the same way yeah that's so good and i, I love that that competition between the nations and and everything like that and how dominant the french are and yeah there's like there's scotland but then there's also england and you know those are two different things and you know there's america you got gwen you got dak yeah absolutely killing it as well and nico and stuff like that and yeah oh god it's so good there's so many characters one that i'd like to see more of is ronan dunn i think he's a he's a much talked about character in the in the studio is uh he's He's just so like he just loves Hoonan. And then he had that like amazing breakout result in Snowshoe where he got on the podium. It's and like every clip is a clip. Like yes. we we we're, we're stood trackside and every time one of us films him, it's a clip. Like he's he's Ronan's so... done it again. Ronan's done it again. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Um yeah, Ronan Dunn's really like yeah, he's a he's a bit of a sleeper. But I think ex- I, if he can if he can keep his head screwed on and, you know, come into the season as he was doing well at the end of last season, he's he's got a real sick future ahead of him. He's you know, yeah. I think I think he's twenty one, twenty two. He's pretty he's, yeah, he's, he's pretty young. He's coming in. And uh a lot of people don't know that he was gonna join the army. So mm, prior Yes, we talk yeah, we, we were talking about this. This is a huge thing that nobody knows is it seemingly that yeah he was about to join the army after that last season and had he not had that breakout result in snowshoe he might well have been enrolled by now mm-hmm. and yeah, i think that's fascinating towel. you know like so somebody with that sort of mentality to want to join the army and then bringing it into downhill i think that's that's fascinating like he's i'd love to hear more from him and i've I've not talked to him enough to even understand more about his character, but he's an exciting prospect. Mm, yeah, Ronan Dunn for sure. No, and then we've got to talk about the Amy Kenyon, um, what's her name, Valentina Roa Sanchez battle that's going to happen next year because you know, in obviously we we really we're all about Amy Kenyon, she's Scottish first <laughs> off, most importantly, the unicorn, and she's had a really amazing breakout season with Pink Bike Racing, but going into next year all of her competition the top five girls bar one are moving into elite so your jenna hastings your isabella yankova um who else have we got in that sort of ross swath of phoebe gale Mm. they're all moving into elite uh females which opens up the junior category a lot for amy and also uh, uh, this other junior valentina and i think there's going to be a a sort of jackson goldstone jordan williams-esque battle and it's i i don't know i think it might get heated that's amazing (laughs) (laughs) i'm putting it out there that's amazing i don't know have you thought about this no i've not until you until you sort of brought it up uh that is I think that's because, like, when do you 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 hardly hear of junior racing, and I think what was so cool about Jordan Williams and Jackson Goldstone is like that was heated. Mm. There was there was I don't know if I'd call it beef, but there was definitely competitiveness, tension, like serious competitiveness between the two of them, and they were head to head all year, and it was just amazing to watch. And mm. like, it's so cool that the juniors are getting. I think I are they getting a broadcast? I'm not I'm not sure. I can't I can't verify or deny that. But like, yeah, especially with the you know with the these junior girls like you know the female side of the sport is getting it's getting so much more competitive every year it's like there's got these the splits are getting shorter and shorter you know you don't see people winning by 20 seconds 10 seconds anymore it's like within the men there's like the top 10 are within a second or two and i feel like within a few years the women are it's going to be the top 10 or within a second or two totally. with all these amazing riders coming up there's it's going so to be many more younger prospects now coming through in the female category mm-hmm. as you say and yeah there's that kind of like top end of the cami Belanche, uh miriam nicole sort of battles that, that go on as well it is really really exciting yeah it's going to be good i think the yeah the female racing stuff is like it's yeah it's cool it's really cool to see and i hope that continues to develop to linger on the new ownership of the sport a little bit the I'm really excited about the implications of reaching new territories of the world. Mm. So at the moment, or with Red Bull, they weren't reaching Japan. And I'm a huge fan 
of Japanese design and just Japanese everything. I just think it's such a cool culture. So now I think we're reaching Japan. And again, like this feels like more speculation that can't be confirmed or denied, but I believe that to be the case that we're going to reach Japan. And I don't know, within the next five years, like, are we going to see a, a Japanese rider come in that maybe was riding motocross, BMX, something like that, that sees the sport for the first time as a result of the the sport reaching new territories and comes in and maybe a Japanese manufacturer um, rhyming with Yonda. Yonda. <laughs> Will, would like to come back in you know i'm a huge fan of honda I've, i own a honda and uh that's amazing yeah yeah that's that just... would be exciting yeah it's like, like the the possibilities are endless with this you know with the uh, getting to a wider audience it, it, the catch net is much wider and the more brilliant people get interested in it the, the more it's going to pop i guess for like you more specifically because you're supposed to be the guest here <laughs> like what is your what are your general goals moving forward? It's like, why are you why are you doing this? Mm. What are you up to? The, <laughs> yeah, the uh, I think this this filmmaking thing has been so ingrained in how I operate now that it's just part. It's, it's what I do. I don't see myself wanting to do anything else. So the filmmaking aspect is hugely important, and that you know something that. Innes said on the previous podcast is like he talked about this you know what's the best thing an athlete can do to get faster and it's ha- be a happy athlete it's like that's completely transferable to filmmaking like what's the what's the best thing you can do to make better films make films that make you happy you know make films that have meaning make films that mean or you know have significance in your life or or for your friends like we we were making this you know, we filmed a little thing in our on our summer holiday in Schladming, and I put that together over the weekend, and I had such an amazing time doing it. Like I was like just reliving the moments, and then it really hard back to that that was those first videos that we put together, which was well that I put together that were just like for my friends, you know, and I and it was almost freeing to to try and think in a way of like I just want to make us something because I I want to make it and I want to show my friends. And I remember like, we're going to, I feel like, I don't know if this podcast is going to come out before that video comes out, but we can hype it up anyway, regardless. Um, but I remember, well, obviously I came down to the the European Strategic Headquarters, which is this studio that we, <laughs> that's what I'm, we need to rebrand the garage yeah. into a studio, but go one step further, European Strategic Headquarters, <laughs> that's what I'm, <laughs> what I'm thinking. <laughs> that's brilliant. Uh, I came down and like, was really excited to show you this video and then we sat down and we were we watched it and it was sick like and that feeling of like i made something you know it's um and it's not for anybody i, I made it didn't make it for you well i made it for us because uh uh so yeah i think in terms of like going back to your question like the why i'm doing it i want to be making films like that again and you know having ambition to make big projects that will have significance and that's what's what i resonate with with sleeper is like this you know telling these untold stories and these slept on characters bringing them to light and you know as we said like the sport of downhill slept on at the moment so bringing that to light to the 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 global consciousness is super important because we're like it's it's our whole world but like for so many people like if you say downhill if you even say mountain biking they're like what's that like cycling up a hill like there's so much people just don't know about the sport it's it, so it's it's really exciting to like be a part of that you know bringing that to everybody and and hopefully getting more people inspired to ride a bike or go out with their friends and mess about in the woods on their on their bikes like we did you know that's yeah yeah i've told this well, not on the podcast, but they, like, I signed up for Twitter when Elon took it over. I was like interested into what he was going to do. I'm not a tweeter though, but they went on and sifting through the categories. What are you interested in? And under sport, it's like football, rugby, golf, darts, no mountain biking. Mm. 
it's nowhere to be seen. So I imagine yeah, if you're in the industry, you're in your own echo chamber. You you think everybody knows about it. <laughs> do, yeah. do you know what I mean? Like it's you don't see people at the pub watching the 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 downhill World Cup. Maybe in some places you do, but like you know, generally it's the football's on or like why can't I get to that? Uh, and I think like the sport itself is it's it's given me and it's given you so much. It's given us our income. It's given us something to do. It's given us our hobbies, passions, everything. And it's such a complete activity. Like I've been doing a lot of motocross recently and I've kind of came to realize that like mountain biking is, it's just so complete given the fact that you're in nature as well. Because mm. a motocross, you're normally like in a sandy field or at a motocross track. Sure, some of them are kind of more like up and down some hills or whatever but you, it's just not the same as that silence and that immersion in the forest that you get with a and that feeling of adventure that you get with a mountain bike it's just such a complete activity and then it's got the adrenaline it's got the the risk it's got the skill it's got the artistic element to it as well and it, it's just such an amazing sport it's given us so much and i think me and you are both just trying to give give back as much as we can mm. and make sure that we can bring it to that next level of awareness somehow through what we do whilst also trying to enjoy ourselves whilst <laughs> during the process. Yeah. Not kill ourselves while doing it. Yeah. <clears throat> that would be handy. No, I'd say it's amazing. To, it's amazing to have you on and, uh, pleasure it's, it's amazing to oh, be it's nice to meet you yeah it's great it's <laughs> great to be involved with uh with you i think we're just such a a great dynamic duo mm. and uh i can't wait for what we've got planned that we've not mentioned on this podcast and it's all just very exciting and you know it looks very promising and i think overall and we're quite optimistic about everything mm. moving forwards yeah, there's so, a lot of opportunity. It's like um, in this, yeah, things unfolding and it's, you can either go and try and create an opportunity area that or just, you know, stay where you are and, and then just, you know, get stuck or fall behind. It's like we're, we're, we're both of the opinion that's like, it's, it's now getting, it's, it's all different and the world's changing really rapidly and we're trying to adapt and, and bring our sort of goals and philosophies to, to light. So it's, it's a pleasure to be working with you. <laughs> amazing uh, yeah well thank you very much we should that's a good way a good way to end it that feels like a natural conclusion 